Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Once again, we thank you for joining us on our Facebook Live. We pray that you're sharing this even now with your friends and family um, at this time. participating um, in this virtual worship experience. Um, I'm trusting that many of you have been clapping your hands and lifting your voices, etc., um, giving thanks unto God um, for all of his great works towards us, while also certainly being prayerful um, this morning for all of those who have been impacted um, by COVID-19, um, for those who have received negative news with respect to their diagnosis. We are certainly praying um, for you, um, for those who are um, dealing with um, difficulties with loved ones and providing care for them as well. We're certainly praying for you um, also. There is a word from the Lord today. It comes from the book of Romans, um, chapter 6. Romans, chapter 6. And as you're finding this place in God's word, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. You're wonderful. You're great and greatly to be praised. Father, we thank you, O God, because we know that you still are seated upon the throne. We thank you, Lord, because you have given us the gift of your word that we might have anchor for the soul, direction for life travels, and wisdom in time of need. Father, disappoint not the expectation of your people. But, Father, we pray, God, in these moments, God, that you will speak to us. But, Lord, we need you to speak more than just to our ears. Speak to the core of our being. Speak to our identity. Speak in places that only you can reach. And we trust you to do this even now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And if you can praise him where you are, feel free to do so. Father, we bless you. Thank we glorify you, Jesus. you. We magnify your name. Romans chapter 6 is what I want to share with you um, this morning. I, I want to preface this by saying a couple of things. Um, one thing I'd like to preface it by saying is that the word of God certainly sits higher than all of us. And so it is never my position or my ability um, to take God's word and to imp imply that it applies downward to others. But no, the word of God sits high and it applies to all of us. And all of us are yearning and, and, and desiring that God would enable us to really press forward that mark for the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And so when we hear um, verses like chapter 6, verse 1, and those that I'll share with you, I, I want you certainly to keep that in mind. Um, that this is about our advancement collectively. Um, certainly there are no big eyes and little U's when it comes to sanctification in the body of Christ. Um, I also want to preface this by saying that um, I, I'm certainly appreciative of the word of God that was ministered um, by Bishop Smith last week when he talked about what shall I render um, unto God for all of his many benefits towards me, and then picking it up in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, um, with those three directives or those three um, imperatives for all of those um, that would seek to please God. This is sort of a New Testament response um, to that, that thought process, and I'd like to sort of continue in that vein. Um, Romans chapter 6, verse 1 says, What shall we say then? We can, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, 
knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead, powerful verse here, is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And I'm going to pause there. Verse 4 again, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. <clears throat> I think it's really interesting. I, I think that we should pause first to consider the chapters that precede this one. Um, and the chapters that precede this, Paul begins to create an argument, an argument that all of us have been um, concluded um, under sin. All of us have messed up. All we like sheep have gone astray, everyone to his own way. There's none that seeketh after God, none that's looking for him. And we find ourselves in a pretty precarious situation, a dangerous situation, alienated from God, alienated from help. But not only are we alienated from God, but our desire is not even towards him, is the argument that the Apostle Paul makes. Um, he also begins to talk to us, by the time we get to chapter 4, about an interesting principle about faith and how Abraham was made righteous, not simply or merely by the works that he had done, but by contrast, he was made righteous by faith, that his faith was counted unto him um, for righteousness. And there's this whole thing that begins to, to open up for us by the time we get to chapter 5 that says, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And if you look at that whole chapter 5 of Romans, one thing becomes evidently clear, and that is that God's grace towards us is so abundant, it's so powerful, that it even causes sinners to be justified. God is able to save and to redeem the ungodly. And as you consider the weight and the reality of that text, I hope that many of you are able to praise God as you look at your own lives and see that it was nothing but the grace of God that enables you to stand where you are in Christ today and in this moment. I think that's important because sometimes we look at all the things that are going around outside and we look at all the things that are being done, we forget about the crucial questions about who we are and what God is doing on the inside of us and what God has done on the inside of us. And so in response to this tremendous outpouring of God's grace, and in fact, Paul will say something along the lines of where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. The question that's asked in chapter 6, verse 1 is, what shall we say then in view of all of this grace that God has stored up for us? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Shall we continue in sin that we may be able to continue um, to have God be glorified by the grace that he's showing towards us undeserving sinners? And Paul's response is not perhaps what you would have expected, just a yes or no of don't sin anymore, but he actually turns the question around and begins to look at not only should we sin, but how is it even possible for us to continue or to remain or to dwell or to abide in sin um, when we have actually um, been made um, dead to sin? How can we, which are dead to sin, continue to live any longer therein? At some point, because of who I am in Christ, I just can't live like this anymore. I can't continue in this. I cannot remain in this. I think that one of the great powerful messages of the gospel is not only that God saves us from the penalty of sin, but that God loves us so much that he does not leave us in the condition that brought about the penalty in the first place. I think it's important in this text for us to recognize also that not only do we have the responsibility of abstaining from sin and to, and to turning to God and to walking the way that's pleasing in his sight, and not only do we have that responsibility, we have the privilege of being set free. And as you read through um, the remainder of chapter 6, perhaps at your leisure, you'll see that um, we have power now over sin, and it no longer has to dominate us. It no longer has dominion over us. It no longer has power over us. But then, of course, that responsibility then calls us to pause and realize, if sin no longer has power over me, I can't blame the devil. I can't blame sin. I've got to start looking at my own choices. Have I really reckoned myself as dead, as the text said, indeed unto sin? And what do I do with this position, with this power that God has given unto me? 
What do I do with this freedom? How do I live in what the text is calling this newness of life? And I would submit to you that, 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 that freedom from sin is only the beginning. As we begin to embrace our identity, we begin to realize that sin actually is what causes um, disruption um, to our fellowship. It, it, it causes disruption um, to God's impartation of things to us. It, it, it causes disruption in so many ways. And we all begin to ask ourselves the question, how can I get sin out of the equation? Not just so that I can say that I, I'm holy and wonderful and all those other things that perhaps might actually instead tend towards another sin, which is the sin of pride, but instead, how can I please God? How can I live in such a way that God is glorified, that God is magnified? And let's get back to that question of identity. How can I live in the greatest purpose that God has for me? Because the truth of the matter is that to the extent that I yield my body, my members unto sin, is the terminology that, that the KJV employs, to the extent that I do that, I'm not being utilized at my highest and best use. There's potential that's going, I hate to say it, to waste. There's opportunities that are being missed. There's things that God wants to do in and through me that perhaps I'm actually standing in the way of. But if I could actually be all that, I'm reminded of that old army slogan, be all that you can be. If I can just allow myself to submit myself fully unto God, imagine what God could do through me, through all of us, and how it could impact our world and impact our community, especially in times like this. I am not surprised that the world is worried and concerned. If I'm honest, there is, I, I, I have concerns as well. I am not surprised that, that the world is trying to find out all the things that it can do in order to, to, to self-preserve, et cetera. I, I'm not surprised by any of that, but I do think that the church has a unique opportunity and perhaps I'll be in a responsibility to actually uh, minister to the world, not just from a, a preconceived notion of, oh, I did this, I did that, but not just do church, but to really be church. What does it mean fully that I have, been, been, have died to sin I've died with Christ by being buried in baptism, and now I'm walking in new life. I think it means, much like Paul, I'm sorry, much like Jesus was saying to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, when he talked about being born again, that that which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. What does it mean now that I have a whole new identity? What does it mean now I'm partaker of the divine nature, is what the apostle will say in the epistle of Peter. What does it mean now for me? Um, now that I have a whole new identity in Christ. And what does that identity in Christ mean for a lost and dying world? How do I translate my Christ experience to the lives of so much, so many that desperately need him? Um, I'm intentionally brief today. I, I don't want to worry your patience for long, but I did just want to drop that nugget um, for you in terms of our identity in Christ, our power over sin, and the great, wonderful opportunity it presents for us um, to be of benefit um, to the world that surrounds us, particularly in perilous and worrisome times as we're living in today. And before we conclude, I'd like to pray. I'd like to pray for a number of things. I'd like to pray for those, again, um, that may be battling um, with COVID-19 personally, for those who have family members that have been impacted. Not only that, but also for those who have been economically um, impacted. And we know the promises of God. And yet, as we stand on his word, it is no secret what God can do. I also want to pray perhaps for someone that is perhaps dialed in today or has come in today. And you may not know the Lord in the pardon of your sins. And you're saying, what must I do to be saved? The answer comes back the same as it did on the day of Pentecost. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, certainly for the remission of sins. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray, O oh God, this morning for all of those that have um, joined us virtually to worship. Lord, we know there's no distance in prayer. We know that although we are in separate locations, that we are unified in you. And Lord, we pray that you will continue to move in every home that's represented and that you will be the great problem solver. 
the songwriter or the, the, the song began this worship session saying, Lord, show yourself mighty and show yourself strong. And many of us need you to do just that today. For those that are lying upon the bed of affliction, for those that are um, trying to comfort family members, for those perhaps that may even be bereaved, Lord, show yourself the God of healing, of comfort, and of, of peace today. And Lord, for those that are that, that, that whose economic situations have been challenged in these moments, I pray, Father, that you will show yourself as provider in the name of Jesus. I pray for churches. I pray for leadership. We pray, oh God, for our own Bishop Smith and for Lady Smith. We pray that you will bless their lives, Father. Look upon all of the ministers and the ministries, Father, in Jesus' name. We pray, God, that you will continue to see us through. And Lord, importantly, we pray, God, don't let us leave this this scenario, this situation, this season of our lives, the same way that we came into it. But Father, we pray for better. We pray that the latter will be greater than our past. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you in Jesus' name. We love you. We are praying for you. I pray that you've been encouraged. God bless you in Jesus' name.